Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. You're very welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us for the first time this morning. And indeed, a warm welcome to our regular attendees. And as always, I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of these intro slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, I'd like to make a mention of uh, RAS Researchers Service, who cover a host of small and micro cap companies, generally companies that aren't covered by some of the sell side analysts. So if you are looking for research on a couple of uh, small and micro cap companies that's uh, institutional grade, please do check out their website. And uh, we're very delighted to have them on board for our virtual as our virtual event sponsor. A uh, quick compliance and disclaimer slide and a warm welcome to anyone from Massic who's joining us this morning. And for anybody who is joining us for the first time, companies we generally have on here, uh, capped under 300 million in revenue or approaching cash flow break even or indeed are already profitable. Uh, we generally don't tend to have companies from the resources and biotech sectors on here, uh, what I like to call industrial microcaps, which can cover basically any of those other uh, industrial sectors. Structure of this morning's webinar, we've got uh, one company instead of two this morning, but uh, we're going to follow the same format, a 20 minute presentation, 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions for our presenter, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. This makes it easier for me to moderate the questions to our presenter. And please note the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning. I can follow us pretty much on all the socials. Twitter is our main one, YouTube, as I said, for the recording of this event. And there's well over 200 companies have presented now at these uh, morning webinars. And you can get all the historical content on the YouTube channel, LinkedIn. And I do write a free monthly newsletter that you can get on Substack that comes out generally the first week of every month. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome back SKS Technologies Group this morning. We've got Matthew Jinx, the CEO, and Gary Beaton, the CFO, joining us. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Matthew, if I can ask you to please start sharing your screen, I'll let you know uh, once I can see you coming through. Yeah, it's just loading now. Yep, that looks perfect, Matthew. Uh, you can uh, take it away. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Coffee Microcaps, for having us on this morning. It's um, uh, Mark introduced. I'm Matthew Jinks, the CEO. SKS Technologies Group, and joining me this morning is Gary Beaton, uh, Chief Financial Officer. So just jumping into uh, into the slide deck here, for, for those that are unfamiliar with the, uh, with the business, we are, are a technology business um, uh, providing supply and installation works uh, covering audiovisual communications and electrical networks. Uh, if any of you have been following us over the past couple of years, we've we've embarked on a number of initiatives to organic, aggressively organically grow the business. Uh, and some of those initiatives um, include the geof uh, geographical spread of the business. And if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide there, you can see all of the offices that we now have uh, across Australia and the presence in, in, in all of those areas. We do do work in Tasmania as well, but we, we typically facilitate that from either Melbourne or Adelaide. Going down the left-hand side there, uh, we, we don't do anything in residential. It's all commercial and, and, and corporate applications. Uh, we feel that over the last sort of four or five years that there really isn't an environment or a sector that we haven't successfully delivered a project in, covering anything from hospitals to hotels, correctional facilities. And as we get a little bit further down into the slide deck, um, uh, we're seeing significant growth in the defence and data centre sectors. Um, looking at the customer base there, we, we, we have had a deliberate approach to, to target a blue chip um, clientele group. Um, a lot of those companies there just give a little bit of a flavour of, of the sorts of customers that we are working for. Often we're not directly working for these cu customers. We will we'll be going through a principal contractor. Uh, but the ultimate goal is to finish that project through that principle and then aim to, to uh, retain and, and work directly for all of those customers. And we're seeing a lot of success in that, in, in that endeavour. Just to, I might hand this slide over to Gary for our first, first half 24 financial performance. Okay, so uh, for the first half 2024, we can all see that we've got uh, 
Yeah, revenue of 54 million versus 44 million in the previous period, which is significant growth and just jumping straight to the bottom line, a bottom line of 1.8 million to 400,000 compared to the same time last year. The key thing I would draw everyone's attention to on this slide is that's a clean profit and loss statement and we don't have very much other income on our profit and loss statement. In prior periods, we have had a lot of other income and albeit that had costs against it, it wasn't necessarily clear from this presentation. So the key message from this PL is top line growth, bottom line growth and a very clean PL. Thanks, Gary. So just going across all of all of the earnings metrics, we can see here that over over the last few years we we've experienced significant growth uh, in revenue across the top line. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we we did embark on um, uh, a significant reinvestment program back into the business over the last couple of years in the vicinity of three million dollars, which we knew came at a short-term profit impact, and you can see in the uh, first half of 23 there versus the first half of 24, is that we, we did experience top-line growth without that flowing through to the bottom line. That was a deliberate approach, and we're now starting to see the fruits of that as we as we come into FY24, and, and once we start to talk a little bit more about work in hand and the pipeline of activity, we expect that to continue in the years to come. From a cash flow perspective, uh, as as Mark alluded to, uh, often um, many of the companies that that come on uh, coffee micro caps are, are close to profitability, or or, or still experiencing maybe uh, having to release a four C. Um, we've recently been relieved of that, uh, having um, been releasing appendix four Cs over the over the last two to two and a half years, where we now uh, see positive working capital on the balance sheet, and we are in in, in profit, as we've mentioned. We've had significant turnaround from the cash flow from, from operations, and you can see there in the first half of 24, a significant increase in, in cash flow from, from operations. Again, we've had a deliberate approach over the, over the last few years to significantly reduce our debt profile, which as at uh, the first half 24, we had, we'd not been using our working capital or we reduced the, the requirement to use our working capital facility. Um, and we have seen um, uh, some fantastic support from our bank in Commonwealth Bank. And as the business continues to grow and see increased activity, we are looking to increasing, uh, increase our bank for, uh, banking facilities, uh, namely in the bank guarantee facility, where we did have a $3 million bank guarantee facility that has, in recent times has been increased to $5 million. And, and with the increase in activity going forward and the pipeline, we are um, talking to the bank at the moment about how we, how we look to grow that and have their support as the business continues to grow. So as I mentioned on a, on a couple of the previous slides, we, we, we have had a, a strategy and a reinvestment program over the last couple of years to significantly grow the business organically. Um, we've maintained that focus on organic approach. We will maintain uh, an opportunistic approach to, uh, to to acquisitions, but we do feel that if we were to embark on an acquisition at this point in time, that it would need to be compelling, um, given the, the the significant organic growth of uh, of the business. We have had a deliberate approach to geographically expand the business across the country, and we opened new offices in Northern Territory um, in particular and reinstated new management in some of our other offices, WA and Queensland in particular. Uh, we've had a, a significant approach to attract people to the business over the last number of years to target um, specific market sectors that, 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 that we wanted to play in, in particular around data, uh, data centres and, and defence. The, the uh, opening of the Northern Territory branch was specifically to target the defence sector and we are seeing some significant wins uh, in and around Darwin and some of the defence bases, Tyndall down towards Catherine, for example. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, data centres uh, in the coming slides, which is a significant growth area for the business. We did start the year with a forecasted revenue um, expectation of 100 plus million dollars. We increased that to 110, and we're now uh, suggesting that that will be north of 120 million dollars. 
So we do feel that the reinvestment program over the last couple of years in the areas that we've wanted to embark on is now starting to translate into bottom line profit as well as the continuation of top line growth. I've got this slide in here just to, to, for those that aren't familiar with the data centre space or, or, or the defence sector and, and, and the opportunity uh, that presents itself in our industry for what we do in these, in these sectors. The Australian data centre market is expected to see significant growth over the next five years in the, order, in the vicinity of 45%. Um, I think the you know the board, the broader requirement uh, and need for data storage is is something that's that's quite prevalent and it's more and more increasing more and more every day. Uh, we will see a further increase with that with the adoption of of AI, which is uh, which is again also becoming more and more prevalent uh, every day. Um, we do have a couple of uh, significant and key customers in that space. Um, we announced in November of last year a, a 30 odd million dollar contract uh, for Stack Data Center, which is a data center operator. And we have completed other works for other data center operators where we are also seeing um, significant opportunity. I did touch on the defense area. We are seeing um, uh, a lot of success in defense, particularly in South Australia and Northern Territory. Um, the enhancement of defense bases in and around. Uh, Tyndall, which is more towards Catherine, a few hours outside of Darwin, um, where we are now setting up some um, uh, some significant projects and, and, and building our presence in those areas. In terms of the work on hand profile, um, again, over the last couple of years, if you if you look at the three uh, the three pie charts down the bottom here, you can see in August of 2022, we were really doing nothing in the data centre space and the defence space. We have been building capability in terms of attracting the right people to the business with the right relationships in order to be able to build capability and delivery capability in those areas. And we can see that that's now starting to become a significant piece of the pie of our overall work in hand. Uh, our work in hand has been significantly growing and work in hand in, in, in our business is a key metric for, for future revenue and, and, and future profit. Um, the interesting thing to, to, to note there is that uh, whilst we've embarked on initiatives to grow defence and data centres, we do feel that there is still significant other opportunity in all of our interstate offices where in many cases they are still in their infancy. Uh, and they're starting to gain momentum and, and traction in their own right. Um, data centres as a percentage is now becoming quite significant with the business just because of the, the size of the projects and, and the scale and the pace in which, they're, in which they're moving, which is quite exciting for us. The underlying theme behind that, though, internally is that we do have significant potential in all the other areas that we've embarked on as well that we still want to see continued growth in. And, and I think that's portrayed when you actually look at all of the market sectors that uh, that we are getting involved in. So before we get to work on hand, obviously, we need a, a growing pipeline of opportunity. Again, data centres leads the table at the top there with significant, um, uh, significant projects of which we have proposals out in the market. Uh, and, and targeted customers that, that, that we're approaching to, to hopefully continue to grow the business in that space. But again, in, in, uh, just with my recent comments around all of the sectors and all of the areas that um, we've had a targeted approach to, we do want to see uh, a growing pipeline of activity and subsequent growing work in hand in all of these sectors. And we are seeing that uh, as well as the, the, the significant um, uh, pipeline with data centres. And overall, the, the uh, uh, open tenders is continuing to grow in terms of the amount of proposals we have in the market, as well as the volume and the value. Just like to touch on um, a partnership and a business that we uh, created in, uh, in August of 2022, SKS Indigenous Technologies. SKS Indigenous Technologies is a, is a company that's 51% owned by uh, an Indigenous gentleman named Chris Johnson, 49% owned by SKS Technologies Group. Um, the partnership with this business uh, was launched in August of 22 for, for a number of reasons. Um, the, the underlying approach with this business is that we're, we're, we're using commercial outcomes to drive uh, Indigenous um, 
uh, participation and in getting involvement in, in, in Indigenous programs. And when we launched this business, we we had an initial target of three percent in terms, as in three percent of our staff to be Indigenous uh, across all of our uh, of all of our group staff. And we came up with that number because the Indigenous population is three percent against the Australian population. We're quite proud to say that we achieved that within the first nine months, and we now have twenty two Indigenous people working within the business, which is circa five percent as I sit here today. So an initiative that we're quite proud of, um, an initiative that we're seeing, whether it's uh, federal backed projects, state government backed projects, or even large corporates, um, where we're seeing uh, a growing number of people willing to support, um, you know, the commercial outcome in, in order to drive those outcomes. Um, the business is Supply Nation certified, um, which does put us uh, in good stead when we are uh, talking to either federal or state government back procurement teams. So in summary, uh, as I've touched on throughout all of the slides, we've, we've embarked on a number of initiatives to support the growth of the business. Uh, we do feel that we're, we are seeing the benefits of all of those uh, initiatives now. We've, we've, we've seen a, a significant change in profile and work on hand. Uh, we've got a growing pipeline of opportunity. We've seen significant improvement in our working capital and a, and a program that uh, since Gary joined the business in late 2019, uh, significantly been working at to, to improve our balance sheet and, and our financing arrangements. We've secured work across a broad spectrum of government um, and, and, and corporate areas. And, uh, and as I just touched on with the Indigenous business there, now sitting with $15 million of work in hand um, is, is something that's quite significant and something that we're quite proud of. Uh, when we talk about our targeted revenue for this year, that, that, that is uh, continuing to increase as, as the months have gone on and we're now talking about delivering $120 plus million in this current financial year. So when you look at the first half, $54 million to do 120, uh, that, that will be 66 million, obviously. And, uh, and we do feel that um, when you look at the first half financial performance, seeing a 3.4% 3, 3 net profit return, uh, we do feel that there's potential for that to increase as well. So got some dependencies. Um, just maybe one to, one to touch on is the company uh, snapshot. Uh, we can see um, there in recent times um, some significant movement in the share price over the last few months, uh, which is quite pleasing. Um, and, and, and we obviously feel that uh, everything that we've been working on over the last number of years, that, that, that's now starting to translate into, into genuine net profit. And we are seeing a lot more interest from the investment community around that. We have uh, the top 20 shareholders now making up just north of 70%. Uh, of the of the overall register uh, of that register, it would be circa about forty odd percent would be made up by uh, the Jinx family, Peter Jinx, executive chairman, uh, Greg Jinx, executive chairman, uh, and obviously myself as the CEO, um, and uh, currently sitting at a market cap of circa sixty million dollars. So, if you're interested in all of these dependencies, you can get uh, you can get the release off the uh, off the ASX. Uh, so to that end, Mark, I might hand it back to you and uh, hopefully we're on time at ne ne nearly 20 minutes. So um, if anyone's got any questions, more than happy to more than happy to address them. Yeah, thanks, uh, Matthew. We've got a few questions that come in already. One um, is talking about the dividend and the fact that they've kind of restarted after after a pause there with the the CapEx program. Um, maybe just touch on the board's thinking on what the payout ratio or, or dividend policy more broadly is um, now that that kind of three million has has kind of gone into the business and uh, you're back to paying dividends. Okay, so um, certainly the intention of the business is to pay a dividend. We haven't formulated a policy or released a policy. Um, at this stage, but we'd expect to be able to pay a dividend, uh, all things being equal. Okay, perfect. And then, yeah, another question is around margins, and I know you just touched on it there, there at the end, but maybe if you can elaborate on that, maybe is there, you know, what should a business like SKS be doing 
you know, on a true to cycle margin, you know, it, it's up from, you know, the prior period is, you know, that that revenue has started to drop straight through to the bottom line. But, you know, to give people a sense of what, a, you know, a steady state margin or a true to cycle margin might look like for this business in, in if we take a, you know, three to five year view. Yeah, so as I mentioned there, I mean, we don't we, we don't talk about gross margin it's, um, uh, with the market, but if we just concentrate on a net profit margin, you can see there in the first half, 3.4%. Uh, you know, we'd certainly like to see that with a four in front of it, uh, um, you know, maybe working to five. Uh, but that, um, uh, you know, that, you know, that's the ultimate goal of the business. But we do definitely feel that there's that there's a bit more potential to lift that three four that's three point four percent definitely. And then in terms of you know having built up the, the this national footprint now, I mean, how important is that to the growth that we've seen in you know the pipeline of work? You know, because it's had a pretty um, you know big tick up with okay the. There's the sector focus, um, but there was also the the push to get the national thing, uh, you know, built out. I mean, how important is having that national presence? You know, when you look at, you know, I see like the Red Cross is on there, you know, Disney, I think Westpac was another one, MYOB. You know, how important is it to be able to go to these customers and say, yes, we've got somebody who can execute in Brisbane as well as execute in part if you know they're looking at those two locations within their broader national footprint yeah absolutely I mean we we, we feel that that's that's super important when when you're working with the blue chip clientele that we aim to target at they often have presence right across Australia and so we want to be able to service that 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 customer in in all parts of the country. You know, you touched on Westpac there. That's a really good example where uh, six years ago we did our first project for Westpac in Perth. We've we've since done work all over New South Wales, Adelaide, Melbourne, Tasmania, and Queensland. And that's the, you know that's a perfect example of a, a of a significant customer that that has presence all over the country that we want to be able to support all over the country um the in an extension to that we also feel it's a good diversification strategy as well and what i mean by that is that whilst we provide the same services in all parts of the country uh, we do do it in very different environments. So our Western Australian office is doing a lot of fly-in, fly-out work up to Port Hedland, not in the mines, but in the surrounding mining camps and facilities and things like that. Uh, you've got Darwin, as I touched on, that is doing a lot of work in, in defence and in and around those defence bases um, and throughout Northern Territory, which, again, is providing the same and similar service, but it's in a very different environment. And... Uh, you know, obviously we're seeing significant growth in, in data centres, in particular in Victoria at the moment, where, you know, there obviously is a large presence of data centres in Sydney, but with all of these data centre operators, there is a significant push to build much larger facilities in and around Melbourne and surrounding suburbs. And, and we feel that we're in a good position to be able to leverage the, the capability that we've built uh, and, and take advantage of that. So it it it's very important to service our national customers, but we also feel it's very important as a diversification strategy in in and around not what we do as a business, but in the areas in which we do it. Okay. Then a question on the um, uh, Aboriginal partnership uh, company. I mean, in terms of that business, you know, winning contracts, whether it's from federal government, the Northern Territory, uh, Territorian government, um, you know, having that, I guess, shareholder mix uh, and an employee base, you know, would it be fair to say that, you know, some of those contracts you wouldn't have won without having, you know, that partnership in place because, you know, part of the tender, the mandate of the government, whether that's federal, state, territory, you know, they're looking to, allocate a certain proportion of budget to um you know aboriginal companies is, is is that fair to say or you know how how does um mm -hmm. you know having that partnership in place you know benefit you when you're sitting down at the table to bid on tenders and and, and you know get in front of customers yeah, absolutely. I mean one of the largest driving factor of of creating that partnership was to be able to drive 
further work in areas that we otherwise wouldn't uh, wouldn't have got. And a, and a really good example of that is we're doing a um, uh, an Indigenous centre in uh, it's called the Manara Centre in in Shepparton at the moment, which is in regional Victoria for those that are not from Victoria, uh, and that is an Indigenous centre where they wanted to 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 spend with Indigenous businesses. And there just isn't anyone in and around Shepparton that has the capability, an Indigenous business that actually has the capability to deliver a project of that size. Now, if we didn't have that Indigenous business, it would be very unlikely that we would target that as a as a project. So there's there's absolutely no doubt that um, we are seeing some significant wins in in areas that we otherwise wouldn't have got because we had that Indigenous business. And that was all part of the initiative. It was part of you know, driving those commercial outcomes that we could then um, uh, use that spend to drive and, and increase Indigenous participation and get involved in various communities and things like that. And and we are seeing a lot of interest from, from many of our customers in and around what we're doing in that space. Okay. A uh, question I know from one of our Melbourne regulars here. Uh, do you still expect revenue booking from the... Footscray Hospital project, um, and just yeah, how is that project going on schedule? Maybe maybe an update on that. Yeah, so new Footscray Hospital for, for for those on the call that aren't aware. So that's the largest health project that Victoria's ever done. It's a a one point five billion dollar build. For us, it's a ten odd million dollar audio visual contract. So all of the audio visual services, operating theatres, digital wayfinding, and things like that. Um, in terms of the progress of the project, they are, um, uh, I guess, effectively have completed the uh, the building of the structure, and they're now fitting out fitting out the building. Uh, to to this end, we've we've really only had two or three people on site. It hasn't, uh, in terms of our you know first half performance, um, New Footscray Hospital hasn't really contributed much at all. Um, because all of our work is still to come. Obviously, providing audio visual services, where we're coming into that project more towards the end. Once it's built, the buildings are built, the the, the rooms are built, so we can begin to uh, to fit them out, and that will probably happen over the course of the next twelve months. So a little bit a little bit to contribute in the next couple of months, but largely the, contrib the contribution of that project will happen in FY twenty five. Perfect. And then, yeah, we've got another contract question, but a more broad one on uh, can comment be made around the progress of delivering the major data center contract? They don't reference uh, which one in particular. Um, again, targets for delivery uh, of that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that uh, so for those that aren't familiar with with data centers, um, they have uh, big halls that, 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 are, that are effectively full of data cabinets and servers. That project uh, has within it nine data halls. Uh, the Thursday before Easter, we were required to hand over the first two data halls to which uh, to which we successfully delivered. And, uh, and there's still seven data halls to go. And the current practical completion of those data halls uh, in its entirety is the end of November. So we'll see a little bit of, uh, so in the first half of our, our results, there is very little of that project within those results. We'll see uh, we'll see that uh, uh, impacting our financials a little bit more between now and the end of this current financial year. And then we'll see uh, three or four months into FY25 where that will, uh, where that will also contribute as well. Um, and then, I just want to reference them because I saw they're on your list of customers that you've done work with in the past next DC. You know, they're out raising over a billion dollars for, you know, expansion of their data center business. Um, I, I know you can't comment on uh, next DC exactly, but, you know, is that kind of capital raising kind of indicative of what you're seeing in the broader data center space of, you know, there's a lot of capital flowing into it purely because there's a need for more data centers, you know, scattered right across the country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So obviously widely publicized a, a significant raise by Next VC last week and, and they talk about using those funds to to expand their facilities in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, Next DC, I, I think in answer to your question, Maha, or, or the person who, who asked the question, that is indicative of what's happening in that space. Next DC are just one data center operator. We're obviously doing work for Stack, as we've just spoken about. 
We're also doing work for Airtrunk, who are who are all data center operators. And then you have people like Microsoft, Amazon, uh, CDC is another data center operator that are all building facilities uh, at, at at scale uh, and 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 at pace as well. Um, so definitely uh, more opportunity there. The 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 interesting thing about that. However, though, is you do need significant delivery capability. So whilst there might be a lot of opportunity out there, um, uh, you know, your delivery teams need to be able to deliver in the timeframes that they need. And and we've spent the last couple of years building uh, two teams effectively to, to, to basically deliver uh, projects of that scale at that size concurrently uh, to take on a third or a fourth, whether that opportunity is there or not, uh, would, would would need significant consideration given uh, the the human resource capability that you need to be able to to, to drive these things home. So um, the short answer is 100% that that raise uh, and what Next DC are talking about there that is 100% indicative of what's happening in that in that space. And we do feel that we're in a pretty good position to be able to to get our fair market share of of what's out there. And then maybe if we can just talk about defence because it is another focus area. Um, could you provide an update? The question is, can you provide an update on the work to secure uh, defence contracts? Is this early stage work that will take time or are contracts being negotiated currently? As we all know, dealing with government uh, and in particular, sometimes the Department of Defence, given the security nature of everything, it, the lead times can be especially long. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They can be long, um, uh, you know, and obviously defence spend is, is widely publicised. They, they, they seem to change their mind um, from, from time to time. Um, but certainly what we're seeing is in and around infrastructure projects, so new new defence bases or new buildings on defence bases and refurbishment of, um, of those defence bases. We are doing a lot in and around communications networks, um, depending on the project. You know, typically all of the projects that we get involved in um, it, it's it's typically unlikely that they would sort of go longer than twelve months. Some some do from time to time, but but as a bit of a general rule, twelve months typically sort of caps out when we'd be delivering uh, the work in hand. Um, and uh, we are in, in recent times seeing a lot of success, as I mentioned, in, in particular uh, at Tyndall, which is a, a defence base about three hours outside of Darwin, more towards Catherine. Um, they're not. Uh, uh, I guess each contract is not material enough to uh, you know to announce, but 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 we are actually uh, picking up significant work in that space. Okay, um, Matthew, I think we're going to leave it there because we have uh, slightly gone over time, and I do want to uh, be respectful of your time and everyone else's. So thank you very much for uh, joining us and coming back to give us an update. It was good to. Uh, hear the story firsthand and um yeah we look forward to since you won't be doing a 4c now in the next uh, week or two we look forward to the full year result uh, sometime in the back end of august fantastic yep thanks mark thanks coffee micro caps and thank you everyone who's joined this morning thank you thanks matthew thanks gary and we leave it there for this morning and i wish everyone a good rest of their thursday thank you